Hello and welcome to That Encyclopedia Podcast with your hosts, me, Will, and Jacob. Hello. So, today, you will have noticed we are discussing the most noble order of the Garter. It's an order of chivalry, so members of the Order of the Garter are knights, and it was founded in the year 1348. As such, it is the most senior order of knighthood in the British honours system. So, we're talking UK here, and we're talking pretty old. Being part of the honours system, it's essentially a badge of loyalty, well, to, a celebration of uh, loyalty and service to the monarch or to the country. Um, and... Having read this article, I'm not 100% sure what else to say about it, really. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it in a bit more detail. Um, but, of course, as mentioned, it's, it's a very old order. Hundreds of years old now. But in terms of what the page tells us about it, there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of, of history specifically pertaining to the order itself. There are a few legends regarding its origin, but the most interesting thing of note probably about the origin of it is that the the word garter in the name, the most noble order of the garter, actually refers to an article of clothing that at a period in history shortly before the founding of it would have been associated uh, with women as a female item of clothing. But with that, I'll pass it over to you, Jacob. What can you tell us about the Order of the Garter? Well, shortest article ever, right? Um, for uh, We may have mentioned this before, but uh, we only do Wikipedia articles that have been featured uh, by the website's uh, senior editors, which means that it ought to guarantee a degree of uh, dependability, veracity, and, dare I say, entertainment for the interested. But this article was featured many, many years ago, and either the person who approved it uh, to be featured uh, was really, really interested in this particular order of chivalry, um, or it's changed quite a lot since then. Because while it is thorough in its um, detailing of how the uniforms work and whether you wear a red sash or a blue sash and who can be a member and some rumors about its origins like uh, will mentioned it really struggles to get off the ground i would say but then a thought struck me actually will maybe that's the point i mean are chivalric orders not just sort of empty posturing <laughs> um I'm not a raving anti-monarchist by any means, but um, if an article that's been featured struggles to say anything other than the sovereign chooses a lim arbitrarily small number of people to be a member of an arbitrarily senior order to have a fancy dinner once a year in almost thousand-year-old clothing, but struggles to say anything else, is that really an indictment of the order as a whole would you say i mean let's take a step back actually w what is an order of chivalry and uh is it relevant in the 21st century well an order of chivalry jacob as i hope you are aware is <laughs> an order of knights so it's a <laughs> a bit of a historically a boys club but more recently that has opened up and the, the, the sort of the idea, the inspiration, the origin of such orders was sort of in the, the Catholic military orders of the Crusades. So from around the 11th century. Um, and of course, incorporating a more medieval concept of the ideas of ideals and ideas of chivalry. Hence, when I read are established in 1348 so that's sort of late middle ages i believe i was thinking 
this page is going to have some intriguing history. It's going to talk about knights and politics and all sorts. And to be fair, I'm sure there has been a lot of interesting history in as much as the actions of members of the Order of the Garter. But that seems to have been confined to uh, those other pages that describe those people and events, because it doesn't go into very much here, except for sort of a, uh, a suggestion that something was going on in the small subsection, Degradation of Members, which maybe we could come to later. But essentially, yes. it's just an idea for a uh, bunch of pseudo-military fellas and a club where they follow a chivalric code or something similar. So is it essentially just a fancy, formal mm, kind of way for a monarch or other senior figure with long-established European histories to distribute good boy points, traditionally, to his or her most loyal servants? It's just a brownie point system. But well... Juice yes, to the gills. <laughs> sort of. I would say, drawing back to the, the sort of concept of orders of chivalry, part of this concept and part of the, the drawing in of, this, of chivalric virtues, or not necessarily just chivalric virtues, any particular virtue, uh, that's generally seen as what an order of knights is designed to do. So an order of knights is composed with a set of rules, and the purpose of these rules in this order is to accomplish or represent a particular ideal uh, or charitable task. But I think in this case, it alludes to a particular ideal. And I do agree that in large part, and especially moving on hundreds of years from the original creation of the order, the meaning behind the behind being being adopted into the order is qu quite different and doesn't really serve the same political interests as it did at the time so do you well, want to maybe explain if, some of yeah i mean <laughs> the political interests of the time uh, so let's 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 briefly cover the the history because it is re really a, a brief history and then i think the advantage of an article like this is that it allows us to springboard into other related areas without any sense of shame or guilt because the article is reasonably short and um, we're not just going to sit here and regurgitate details about uniforms uh, which is at least half the article um, for 20 minutes so <laughs> it, it it invites us as summarizers to branch out and with most articles that we review for want of a better term we don't really get that chance because the articles have so much meat to their bones but this is quite a quite a a, 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 a bony article so to speak so being founded by uh, an english monarch called king edward iii in 1348 makes it one of the oldest uh, oldest orders of chivalry in the world that's still uh, still going and king edward iii for those of you who don't know uh, in your English sovereign history, was uh, the ruler of England. This is in a time before it was uh, united with Scotland uh, for about half of the 14th century. I think he was monarch from 1327 until 1377, like a 50 year period. Uh, he ruled well. I think is the general consensus. He ruled for a long time, you know, 50 years in the 14th century, not bad at all. He ascended to the throne young, had to succeed in a soft coup d'etat to depose his his mother and possibly his stepdad. A bit hazy on the details, but after ascending to the throne at an early age, he proceeded to rule with a mixture of odd clemency and military prowess. He was, in many senses, a conquering king, because King Edward III laid claim to the throne of France and initiated uh, the Hundred Years' War, which would outlive him. The first phase of the Hundred Years' War is often referred to as the Edwardian 
War, or the Edwardian phase, and uh, it's the phase in which I believe England did uh, performed at its best, relatively speaking, and uh, King Edward III is often credited for that. But of course this leads us to uh, the Order of the Garter, being founded around kind of the, the midpoint of his reign when his mind was hell-bent on conquering France, which he saw as his divine right. Meaning the purpose of this order, as you were discussing, Will, uh, the original founding objective of this order is to formalise knights, noble people's support to an English monarch's claim on the throne of France, which is awkward in the 21st century for several reasons. Um, the most obvious of which is that France doesn't have a throne anymore and hasn't for about 200 years. So it's a bit pointless, <laughs> basically. There are 24 primary members of the order, not counting the monarch, the, well, at the moment, the monarch himself. Um, and the monarch's sort of immediate heirs and royalty and supernumerary members like other monarchs. And um, those people who are gifted membership of the order are allowed to use the symbol of the garter, which looks like a very thin belt with the phrase in French, Oni soit qui mal y pense, shame be to him who thinks evil of it, uh, around their heraldry. And it is interesting when you start looking at European um, heraldry, how many knights and monarchs have the Order of the Garter around their crest. Uh, it's almost like a Illuminati-style sinister symbol that keeps cropping up. But besides that detail, it's a relic from an ancient time. And I would struggle to elaborate anything more on it unless I were to start going into excruciating detail about who leads the procession and what uniform they wear and when the procession takes place and this that and the other i think the only thing that stood out to me reading the article from a politics background is that this is one of the few gifts of the british honors system which is entirely within the purview of the monarch both de jure and de facto a lot of british honors honors lists they're called we have the monarch's birthday honours and New Year's honours and sacred day honours and that sort of thing are officially bestowed upon individuals by the monarch, but in practice are given by the prime minister and the government as part of the division of powers and the sovereignty of parliament. But the Order of the Garter is an exception to this. Um, in the past, it has been um, de facto in the purview of the British government, but I think ever since, uh, was it Churchill, um, the Prime Minister has kind of ceded that uh, back to the monarch. So it is the sovereign's decision or the royal family's decision. Um, they get to decide uh, completely amongst themselves. And I think for that reason, a lot of the members are set in stone, by which I mean the, t the, the title of another ancient institution is in practice tied to being a member of the Order of the Garter. So for example, being the Dean of Windsor normally uh, also gives you membership to the Order of the Garter. Being uh, one of the senior bishops will give it to you as well. Being a foreign monarch in Europe will probably give it to you as well as a supernumerary member. Being the Prince of Wales will always give it to you so on uh, and so forth. Now that's kind of my meandering summary of uh, the Order of the Garter. Was there anything else that kind of stuck out to you, Will, um, about the article or about what I've kind of just recounted? Well, from what you've recounted, I would say, I imagine one of the reasons why this, the ability to appoint these honours was restored in total power to the monarch is that it's a it's pretty limited order. So anyone who follows the 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 actions and the uh, appointment of people to the house of lords may know that the house of lords has really bloated and burgeoned in size over recent decades mm. because 
I'm not sure if there's um, even... There, there might be a, a limit, but I'm not aware of there being a limit on the number of appointments and the yeah, number of potential yeah. seats. And given that the, the House of... Bear in mind the House of Lords has an active role in UK politics, so there's some... If we were to allow the monarch to have this this complete power essentially bestowed upon them once more by uh, Winston Churchill and Clement... Clement Attlee? Yeah. yeah. Give it, if, if that was bestowed upon the monarch, then that would essentially give them the right and the permission to just appoint people willy-nilly, as you could say, into the House of Lords and to have them actually affecting a role in politics, which uh, could be seen as fairly sus <laughs> under the constitutional monarchy system. Uh, it wouldn't be particularly democratic. However, as you said, actually I'm not sure if you did say, but leading on from that, there is a limit to the number of members of the Order of the Garter. And I think that's probably one of the core reasons this is something we allow the monarch to do. See, there are, there are no more than 24 living members or companions aside from the sovereign themselves. And I don't believe it can be expanded. But no, maybe, I don't maybe... think it. I don't think it has, ever has been expanded, even if it technically could be. Yeah. Um, I mean, but, uh... <laughs> to me, actually, the most, the most, the most exciting part of this article is always, or, or any article like this, is <laughs> observing the ridiculous complexity of personal insignia and um, heraldry and livery that uh, is quite well documented on Wikipedia. Um, I'm talking about the arms that you see in um, on medals, on flags, in uh, official, um, what's the term, documentation, that you see flying around castles, on military parades, formal clothing. All of these are chock full in many sovereign militaries of extremely oversaturated heraldry. I think less is more, but due to historical reasons, I suppose, the people who determine what new heraldry to create don't seem to have got that message. But some of them are very entertaining. Did you see the arms, for example, of Margrethe II, Queen of Denmark, the personal arms, which uh, has the Order of the Garter belt around it, but um, uh, her heraldry is flanked by two extremely buff dudes holding clubs and wearing nothing but uh, a wreath of leaves and a matching loincloth. Have you seen this? I've, uh, I've not. I've not seen this. How, how do you spell her name? Margareta, uh, M A R G R E T H E. Uh, but I will also send the image to you as well. Um, well, I, I, yes, I may do. put it. I will put it on the banner for the video as well um, <laughs> for everyone. Um, examples like this are worth viewing. Um, in my wow, opinion. that's yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. It almost looks, it, it almost looks like it was made for someone's. It almost looks like it was made for us, made for someone's YouTube channel. Like this does not look how I'd expect a coat of arms to look. They never do, um, but you see the the order of the gut belt around it there. Yes, and yeah. that's why I, that's why I would say that it's almost like a. An Illuminati style. Um, it's just uh, a plug. It's just there in everyone's, yeah. everyone's, everyone's always bad looming. art. That's it. Always watching. I'm surprised there aren't more conspiracies around it. But I like all the little red hearts around the three lions. That's yeah. very lovely. Yeah. Um, I think there are people who dedicate their lives uh, and spare time to describing and documenting heraldry. There's a, an entire vocabulary of terms in vexillology, and heraldry is a subcomponent of that. Oh dear. To formally describe 
how flags and banners and symbols are presented and there are ancient rules and traditions that must be followed it's it's kind of interesting but extremely complicated and all tied up in history perhaps the most um, i suppose the word would be curious implication of the article is what purpose such an order really serves these days i know we've kind of touched on it at the beginning but maybe we could circle back to it now with this additional context i mean it's well uh, known for example that the majority of uh, peerages excuse me not peerages but um, honors in the british honor system go to a very small group of people there are exceptions people who do very well in the entertainment industry for example um, singers actors um, uh, leaders of major charities often as well um, in a slightly different sector but uh, a huge number of honours just go to civil servants. Um, you would be hard pressed to find a permanent secretary, which is a kind of professional bureaucrat leading a government department um, to ensure its stability as ministers come and go, who isn't a knight or lady in some capacity. For the longest time, and possibly still, uh, it's considered just part of the job. As you get promoted through the civil service, you acquire and accumulate honours and little uh, suffixes after your name. Do you think that's something that is acceptable? <laughs> um, is it perhaps I mean, something that should be refined? Uh, it, it doesn't particularly bother me, but I find it pretty strange. Um, like, I understand why it happens, and civil servants have some very important jobs, and they are indeed serving the country in a sense but I mean lots of people are serving the country in various ways and they will not get recognition it's one of these things that yeah it's 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 very challenging for me to conceptualize and to put into words I agree it feels like something that should bother me but just doesn't because Seem, it strikes me as so meaningless. Yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> it does. It's 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 fairly meaningless. And the reason why it would go to senior civil servants is because they work with the politicians who can nominate them, right? That's sort of how it works. Mm. Whilst obviously there are, even within like non-government related public institutions, you'll have people doing very important work directly for society but even people who aren't working directly in the public sector i mean everyone <laughs> everyone who's working conscientiously caring about society and those around them is in some way deserving of some positive recognition but frankly uh, there's just too many people to recognize that recognizing individuals just I mean, it doesn't feel like the recognition, the honours really tie very much to what they've done. And I, I'm part of that is the fact that, uh, maybe controversially, although I don't really think so, there are plenty of people who have been awarded honours where this is very much a political thing and they've not really done very much exceptional for the public good. It's just sort of a thing that you pick up if you're in the right job or if you know the right person and in that it's way I'm very critical yeah it's just a perk and there are people other people who work with them or around them that may have worked a lot harder or a lot longer or genuinely care more about what they do but that's not really how you get recognised in these things I don't know I've never been a particularly awards focused individual and that goes probably extends to awards that are arguably significantly more meaningful. Yeah. I think we're, we're coming towards the end of uh, the episode, just a, maybe a, a minute or two left, and I think it's it's been reasonably clear that we've really kind of struggled to, to really expand on something so hollow, for want of a better phrase. I, <laughs> which I, which I don't is we don't be, care about honours. <laughs> I, I don't mean to be, um, like overwhelmingly critical because I don't really have anything against 
the noble order of the garter or indeed any order of chivalry precisely because it's so um, plain <laughs> for all the pomp and circumstance that surrounds it because there's no official criteria other than it's whoever the monarch just sort of taps on the shoulder um it's membership for life unless it's withdrawn there are no perks beyond getting to call yourself sir or lady and there's no distinct power no. that comes with it it's, it's and I, I don't know who the members are or what they've done so it's not even really a particularly it, it's not say like a an award even even an employee of the month if you were to see a sign with an employee of the month and you knew that person you'd sort of like know them and if you cared about your job maybe have some inspiration but if you don't know who they are or why they have the honours then it is effectively meaningless yeah so let me instead conclude by asking you will if you have seen the new wikipedia scrolling layout i don't know if this is a beta feature um because uh, if you're not aware, you can make a Wikipedia account for free, which gives you a lot of customizability with the website, including enabling beta features, which I personally have. Um, were you viewing this article on a large screen device, like a laptop? I'm on a, a laptop, yes. If you have the um, browser in full and you start scrolling down, does the name of the article kind of appear as a banner at the top for you? Not for me. Hmm. Maybe they'll be rolling it out soon, but it's a, an exciting new presentation um, of reading Wikipedia articles. And it's the sort of thing that you would only notice or care about if you do them <laughs> regularly, which you may have noticed we do. Yeah, well, but, uh, well addition... now, Jacob, exciting. Let's calm ourselves. Well, uh, well, I'm then... sure it's, it's a nice little aesthetic improvement there. <laughs> Wait, but you, I haven't told you the best bit now. The okay. contents table of the article, normally reserved to the top, now accompanies you as you scroll down mm. as a separate list which means you can jump to any part of the article from any other part you no longer have to scroll up to the top now to click on the thing is, that's truly an improvement now that, exactly. i have to say i clicked if you i clicked on order of chivalry and i do have a page with a slightly different format not 100 percent fitting your, your description but similarly there is a contents page that is following down with me. But yeah, that's pretty good. There you go. See? Change. That's my that's my meta point. Ooh. Adaptation. Yeah, you were just Modernization. It was subtle, <laughs> but now you've pointed out that yeah. <laughs> maybe radical reform is a good thing. <laughs> oh well, anyway. I think that's probably just about time. But um I hope you've been educated on this ancient and esteemed order and can appreciate what it is. If you do appreciate what it does, feel free to let us know, because personally I really struggled to figure that, out, that one out. <laughs> it would be interesting to hear an opinion from someone who still sees value in this. But thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Until then. Thank you.